Hey, there we go. How's it going? Uh, so this is a small audience. I don't mind, you know, like we can just sort of treat it like a discussion. So you can just jump in if you have any questions at any point. Uh, my name is Nick Fortuno. I'm a, a game designer and interactive narrative designer and artist uh, with technology, I guess is a good way of putting it in this context. Uh, I wear a lot of hats uh, and the hat I'm going to be wearing today is that technology-based interactive narrative hat. And what I'm talking about is, the, is a concept that I've been working on for a while of um, the idea of what it means for an audience to be a participant, specifically from the perspective of state-driven systems. So I'm going to define state. I mean, if you're coming from a computer science background of any sort, you probably already know what I mean by state-driven. But I'm going to define that for you as I see it in, in this understanding. Now, this is interesting to me. And it, it's really the byproduct of my, my MFA research, uh, which was in design and technology at Parsons. Uh, it has to do with like, sort of how we think about audiences. Um, and so in a traditional theatrical setting, we have an understanding of an audience that's, that's actually a really defined understanding, particularly in a proscenium environment, which is that the audience sits and watches the thing, right? And that, that is the relationship the audience has. And that is a very well-known relationship that much art is based on, and it works very well. But when you start asking questions of how the audience can be a participant in an experience, that obviously is a problematic relationship, because this is not a good setting for participation, like in, and it's kind of kind of obvious in the layout that this is not a good way for this many people to participate in a performance if their participation is more than simply observing, or rewarding or punishing the performers. So when we look at um, the world of sort of like live entertainment today, we actually see a few models of attempts to allow participation to take place that are sort of working themselves out. And, and just to say this out loud before I get into any of this, I'm going to speak critically of some of these forms, which doesn't mean I dislike them as a whole. It's more that I think we're in an early stage of thinking about this stuff, uh, at least in the, modern, uh, in the modern manifestations of it. And there's a lot of potential for this to grow. So when I'm critical, I'm really critical because I think there's potential, not because I think the work is necessarily bad. Um, the primary mode we see um, in a lot of this work is, is what I would talk about as exploration. This is essentially basically like allowing an audience to move through a space and then discover things about the space. Um, this is a lot manifested in work like Punch Drunk Sleep No More or other immersive theater pieces in which people are allowed to explore sets on their own or wander spaces on their own and the experience of the art is that wandering. Now this I think gets its most essential manifestation in escape rooms, which are a, like a relatively modern kind of entertainment. It was born out of game-based entertainment that was originally like web-based entertainment where you would see a flash application and you would like click around to solve puzzles. And then in Japan, they brought that into the world and then that started to spread around. You can, I don't know how many of you have ever done one of these, but probably you know what I'm talking about. You go in and you solve puzzles, you try to get out of the room in an hour. Um, this is a business model that's been somewhat successful, but it's kind of problematic, um, in part because of how the exploration works. Essentially, um, in an escape room, the, the exploration is manifested as puzzles. There are challenges that you have to achieve, and there's a game structure that's being used, which is essentially a way for you to judge your success or failure, and it gives you a motivation to go through the experience. Um, and that's a really kind of motivating thing for people, but it also has a major problem, um, which starts to tie back into both of the reasons why explorations don't really work. One reason why exploration is problematic is because in a very large space with a lot of content, it's really hard for that to be a meaningful thing. Um, and one of the things that's pretty well known about a piece like Sleep No More is that the set design, while very rich and powerful, there's lots of really beautiful, ornate sets, don't really contain anything narrative. If you start looking around the set, like if you start going through this desk or these papers or these file cabinets, you're not actually going to find stuff that adds up to the narrative of the piece. That's not what it's there for. So while you can explore, the exploring is meaningless. The game-like mechanics of escape rooms allow us to create meaning out of the experience. But the problem is most of the time, people lose. And they have to lose 
Because if they won every time they went into an escape room, it's not a challenge. But the problem is, an escape room is a challenge that takes an hour to solve. So if you fail at an escape room, you can't really do it again, because you would have to relive most of that hour just to get back to the point at which you failed. So most escape rooms tell you the answer when you leave, which means you lost and can never win. That is not a good game. So there's a problem about repeatability here. Now, Sleep No More solves the repeatability problem, right? Like, people come back to Sleep No More many, many times. But at the end of the day, there's not really much value to that exploration, and most users drop off. So between these two problems, we see issues with the current manifestations of exploration. Other kinds of participation exist, though. We have what are in immersive theater are called one-on-ones, right, where a performer will actually have an encounter with a user and engage in that encounter. What you're looking at is a space in New York called Zero Space. Uh, in the Zero Space environment, you go, you go into a, a big room with a lot of projection mapping and light sequences, but also these people dressed in these costumes with these very ornate wooden masks who claim to be aliens from another dimension. And they have an encounter with you where they like mime something or talk to you through a microphone and they get you to think about the human experience. Um, a lot of work right now is exploring one-on-ones. One-on-ones are considered essential to Im immersive theater. And in fact, technology pieces such as Draw Me Close, which was sponsored by the NFB, a piece out of Canada, um, in which you live through a VR experience of an illustrated child's world but a human actor is there in the role of the mother you encounter who actually interacts with you directly by hugging you and putting you to bed. That experience is extremely powerful, but there's a problem, which is that I need a mother for every single person who goes through the show. Right? I need an alien for every single person who goes through the show. So as a scalable experience, this doesn't really work. It's like it's wonderful if you're that one person who gets to see Draw Me Close, but put Draw Me Close in a festival, and the show takes 25 minutes, and it's up for four hours, and you had an audience of eight people. Right? I have a bigger audience in this room right now for something shorter. Right? So the idea that that is going to be a successful entertainment experience is really hard to imagine. And so that is another problem with this kind of thing. And then finally, there's like a whole bunch of work that's involved in the act of co-creation. This is a live action role playing game you're looking at here, a traditional one with the foam swords in the field. Um, and this is a really powerful form that's been around for a while. It's a, actually a wonderful art form that's developed a lot of really interesting stuff. And it very powerfully and very um, deeply, very meaningfully introduces interactivity because the choices you make on a battlefield actually determine the outcome of the battle. Like, the whole narrative is basically dynamic to you. Um, and this has led to really fascinating work, work about gender politics, work about, this is the, the work on the right called Man About, uh, the left called Man About the Boy, work about um, examinations of the AIDS crisis in the 80s, which is um, Just a Little Loving, or whole reenactments of brand identity. This was a uh, Harry Potter LARP that was run in a Polish castle. Um, that they run every so often. Um, but the problem is, like even hearing this work, you probably get the sense of how difficult it is to participate in. It actually requires you to know who your character is, learn the character, learn the rules, and keep your character in mind, act as your character the entire time. And so while this is a very powerful experience for people who are willing to do it, not many people are willing to do it. It's not approachable. It certainly isn't approachable the way that going to a play is approachable, because all you have to do is sit down. So if we add all this up, we can see that there's a kind of desire set we could have for successful audience participation. Um, we could say that we want it to be meaningful, meaning that the audience does something and the audience choices have a value. We could say it needs to be repeatable, such that one time through the experience doesn't exhaust it, um, and I, le I can leave in a satisfied way or return. It needs to be scalable. It can't simply be for like one or two people at a time because it's just simply impossible to imagine it as a product at that scale. And it has to be approachable. If it's too difficult to understand or too difficult to access or requires too much work, there's no way I'll do it. And so I lose that audience. So how do we get there? All right. As I was studying in, uh, in Parsons, I came to a conclusion. This was like sort of the research that I did. And that came from the Internet of Things. Like, looking at the Internet of Things, I saw the possibilities for things to happen that could solve all the issues that I brought up. Now, 
Um, this is usually what people talk about when they talk about the Internet of Things. This is an old image, but I like it because it's like there are cars and there are factories and there's medical devices and it's like like the and, and the IoT thing where like IoT is going to transform the whole universe and suddenly our world is completely different. And that's actually not the IoT I'm interested in because I don't find it interesting for art. I'm interested in this IoT. Do people recognize that? That is a hotel key card. That is an RFID system. Um, the way it works is that there's a reader on the door and your card has a chip in it and when you put your chip against the card it checks the ID of the chip to see if it matches the room and if it does it unlocks the lock and if it doesn't it doesn't unlock the lock. Have any of you ever thought about what your hotel key card actually is before? Right, one person in the back, right? Because it doesn't matter, because you don't care. You go up, you tap the card, the door opens. The only time you think about what that technology is is when it doesn't work. And then you're wondering if you tapped it wrong, or maybe you're supposed to tap it somewhere, or maybe it got screwed up somehow because of how you tapped it. Now you're thinking about what that card is, but when it works, you don't even think about it. You're thinking about, I just got back from the conference and I'm going to the pool, boop, and then you're in your door. Or, wow, that was a great night with my partner, and now I'm going back to my room, boop. Or, oh man, that meeting could have gone worse, I'm just going to drink something, boop. And that's, the door is not part of your experience, right? It's kind of like magic. Uh, I call that seamless technology, right? Technology without seams, meaning you don't notice the technology, right? Of course, like everything that's stitched is seamed, but not everything looks like it's seamed. Some of it looks like it's just smooth. I don't have any breaks. Does that make sense? Technology that does that is interesting because it gets out of the way. It doesn't interrupt my experience. And when you start thinking about that, then you start having this, like, the idea of, well, well, okay, if the technology could be seamless, then I really wouldn't have to notice it. And I started to do research on that. Let me see if I can get this video to play. Um, I basically started doing research on different kinds of technologies that would allow me to embed things and track things without people noticing. So what you're seeing is an RFID reader and an RFID chip. That white chip is a chip. It's this big. You could look, I could put it in, in this fabric, and you wouldn't notice it. And as you look at the monitor, you can see uh, I'm actually tracking how many seconds the chip is on the reader. The reader, which is this big, which I could also embed in just about anything. Anything wood, anything plastic, anything glass. So I could hide the reader, I could hide the chip, and I could put the chip on the source, and I would never know it was there. And so I could know what that chip was. And you'll also notice there's an ID on the chip which I'm reading, so I know which chip it is. So I could know one chip from another. I could actually detect you versus you versus you. And if I gather that chip at another station, like I check in somewhere else, as I just did, I can download the information that I stored on that chip, and then, as you'll see in this image, this won't be super clear, so I'm just gonna explain it, I could pass it into a database so that I could record what the score is that you got. So the sixth score there changed in number because I tracked it. But you didn't know I did that. Because that chip, that chip is this big. And that reader is this big. Does that make sense? Um, so that became really interesting to me because if you have access to that, then you have access to this thing that makes computers magic, one of the things that makes computers magic, which is state, right? Like, a, like what digital technology allows us to do is record changes from input and store them so that other things can access them. And that potential becomes magic if you think about that in the world. Because what that means is I could know if you went somewhere and have the show know you went there. I could know that you opened something and tell that to an actor in the space. I could change the direction of an audio cue or a visual cue based on a character that you picked by touching something early in a show. And you would have no idea any of that happened. But the system knows and the system can track it. Now suddenly I have the potential to create repeatable experiences. Because now I can give you two things to touch, and the show will just be different based on the one you touch. I can make meaningful experiences because I know what you touch, so your choice matters. I can make approachable experiences 
because all you had to do was touch something. I didn't ask you to do anything special. And I can make scalable experiences because I did that without a single human being. Now, the way that's manifested for me in my work is largely through the Columbia Digital Storytelling Lab, where I work um, largely with a, a teacher there and a creator named Lance Weiler, who I've done work with for a long time. I'm going to walk through some of the work I've done with him. Um, quickly, just to talk about how state has manifested in this work, because this all this happened around the same time. Um, the first piece that we did together was a piece called Sherlock Holmes and the Internet of Things. Uh, this was a, an experiment in sort of like co storytelling co-creation, like could we get a bunch of strangers to tell a story together. Essentially what happens is you show up and we hand you some tape and we say there's been a murder and you have to solve it and we give you tape. And you ask, uh, and you ask what was the murder and we just say here's your tape. And we do that until you kind of figure out you're going to tape out a body yourself. You tape out the body in a small group and several small groups tape out bodies at the same time and then we go through a clue gathering phase where you walk around and distribute clues at other people's bodies. You do not do this at your own body. You do not return to your own body until the end of the piece. But you drop clues on other people's bodies. Maybe you drop an item there or you modify an item to say what it is. Oh, there's a lighter here. There's an empty lighter. You know, there's a, there, there's a, there's a pair of glasses here, but they're broken. Right? And you just leave that there with no explanation. And then at the end of the piece, you return to your body, which is now covered in all of these clues that someone else left, and you tell the story of what happened. State exists here because we have a recording of what everyone did. Right? We literally write it down. So this is like non-digital state. We do it with post-it notes. We do it with markers. Yeah. No, we just tell them to do it. We tell them to do it, but we don't tell them what to do. We just tell them, like, oh, now you're going to go find clues on other people's bodies. Here are some sticky pads and note cards. Go. And then they make up whatever they want. We never have any idea what they create in these experiences. Although we tell them it's Sherlock Holmes, so it tends to be Sherlock Holmesy. Story's be a mess at the end, right? Well, no, because people assemble them. They come back and they tell a story. And we advise them that in police investigations, we know that not every piece of evidence you find at a crime scene is necessarily related to the crime. So they do a little bit of selection, and they decide that the broken glasses don't really matter, so they don't talk about them, but the lighter is critical. But maybe another group decides that the lighter doesn't matter, and the broken glasses are critical, and that's what we leave up to them. Now, we don't care what stories they create, really. That's not what's important about this. We're not there to write down or film their stories. We just want to know. We just want them to create. Now, this is interesting, but it's not totally scalable because it's all post-it notes and stuff like that. Like, you need a lot of docenting to make this thing work. Like, someone has to walk through it. So in our future work, we started moving to more technical pieces. Um, the next thing that Lanson and I did together with an artist named um, Rachel Eve Ginsberg and several other artists, including choreographers and dancers and technology artists, was a piece called Frankenstein AI. Frankenstein AI uh, was shown at Sundance in the New Frontier Festival and at IDFA. Um, in Frankenstein AI, I'm going to see if I can play this video here. I don't know if this is going to work. Here we go. Um, I'm going to talk over this. There's, some, there's, there's audio in it. Uh, but it was based on the Frankenstein myth, and we kind of translated that to AI. So we created an artificial intelligence. This is real. We actually spun up an artificial intelligence. Um, and we trained it on certain kinds of Frankenstein texts, but also like a Reddit text to give it some base language. And then we made an experience where people interacted with the AI, where the AI had, in, in our narrative, discovered the narrative of Frankenstein. This was the manifestation of the AI, a projection map tank of smoke and a set of IoT drums um, that would play when the AI spoke, which was a speech-to-text program. So the AI would ask questions of the audience, and then the audience would answer those questions, and that text would be input back to the AI, which would sentiment analyze it, come up with a new state, and then generate a question based on what it heard. Uh, the way the AI was seeded initially was that the audience went through a series of storytelling exercises with each other that they mapped onto these surface tables uh, using this IoT planchette we created. Uh, you'll see it come out in a moment. Uh, and so their storytelling created the initial emotional state of the AI, and then we used that emotional state to move them forward. This was a complicated piece. <laughs> Uh, so, 
Uh, this is what the system actually looked like. Uh, we had an AI in a cloud that was communicating with a Pi that was just basically running the server for the entire system. Um, we took a web form from the users when they came in to get some kind of data out of them to get the initial state of the AI. And then they were set in a room with surface tables and they manipulated the surface tables to give the AI more data. Um, all the data that was done through the web form is passed through HTTP. All the data internally was passed through OSC, which is Open Sound Control, which is an awesome, awesome, awesome uh, localized technology for passing data back and forth on a single router network. It's really, really good and super easy to use, so I recommend it. Um, the Pi sent this data by HTTP to the cloud. The AI analyzed it and came up with text. It spat the text out in text-to-speech, and then it changed the state of the drums and the projector to, based on its emotional state, which was an evaluation it made based on the statements it heard and how it responded to them. The room would answer the question the AI asked, and a docent would type it in. We did that because the microphones in the room were kind of crap, so we couldn't do um, speech-to-text back. That was just, we would have, but the room was just really, did not mic well. Um, and then the AI, the Pi would send that text to the cloud, repeat, and rotate it. Now, what I want to point out about this is we had a person backstage at Frankenstein AI. Um, that person did three things during the entirety of the hour and a half show. The first thing that that person did was turn on the surface tables at a certain point in the show. When you first walk in the room with the surface tables, they're off and dramatically we want them to come up. The only reason we had someone backstage do that is because we didn't have time to time it perfectly and we didn't have time to train the performer to time it perfectly, so we could have done it on a timer, but we just didn't want to. So that was one button we could have removed. Second thing that the person backstage did was choose something from what the AI said to pass to the audience. The AI hadn't been evolved enough by that point that we felt super confident about what it was saying. So it would pick something, but it would give a couple of their options. And if the thing it picked was really terrible, sometimes the person backstage would choose one of the other things and send that instead. We could have had the AI just send it, though. And then we wouldn't have needed a human being for that. The third thing the human being did was reset the show. Otherwise, everything you saw happened automatically. So we could run this entire show with no human beings backstage and just someone coming in and hitting a reset button when an hour and a half was over. That's the potential of this technology. Still not steady enough for me, though. Like, I, I don't, this isn't far enough for me yet because it's still, like, not tracking users. So, uh, oh, by the way, I, I wanted to show this because this is not what my graphs look like. This is what my graphs look like. <laughs> Uh, this is the version of Frankenstein AI we did at IDFA, which was slightly different. We had these dinner parties, and the AI spoke to you during the dinner party. But like, just to show you, like, this, is literally, these, this is literally the drawing I did to explain to everybody how the technology worked. Um, and so these ki this kind of diagramming, I think, is essential to this, this practice. Um, so the piece we're working on right now is called The Raven. Uh, the Raven is based on uh, Edgar Allan Poe's work, uh, and it has, it's a commemoration of uh, the, it, it's landing around Edgar Allan Poe's death, and we're in an anniversary of, of Edgar Allan Poe's death. And if you don't know Edgar Allan Poe's history, he had a really crazy life where he burned a lot of bridges, and his death was super weird and disturbing. He, he was basically found unconscious in clothes that weren't his own, kind of incoherent, out of nowhere. He was supposed to show up someplace, and he didn't show up, and then like a couple days later, he's just like unconscious and in someone else's clothes. And then he goes to the hospital, and he dies alone. After he dies, people steal everything he had on him, and they start selling it. Uh, his main obituary was written by a major enemy of his who basically just trashes him through the whole obituary. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting story of like how alcoholism and, and, and depression can destroy someone's life. And we're exploring that because, you know, I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's dark. Uh, we're doing this at the American Irish Historic Society, which is this like three-story uh, historic mansion that's across the street from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, it's not a very convenient technical space, so we're going to run a lot of routers through it. Um, and effectively, we're running the show, though, as an immersive theater piece for 24 people. Um, and it goes on for about two hours. But there's one actor in the performance. There's one docent in the performance who sets you up at the beginning, and that's it. You don't encounter another human being through the show, except there are other guests. But uh, you are constantly communicated with 
through a pair of uh, AR glasses. These are the Bose AR glasses. I don't, are people familiar with those? Uh, so it's audio AR. The glasses don't do anything, uh, like the glasses part. But there are speakers in them. And the speakers are connected to a device. And the speakers can, can know, track things about how your head moves and where you are. And they play a kind of spatialized audio. And so uh, we're going to run the entire space through with beacons, which are little Bluetooth devices that shout their name. Um, and so by doing that and by giving you an IoT device, which is a lantern that you carry, we can track you through the space. Like we can know where you are. And by knowing where you are and where we are in the show, we can then feed information to you. So essentially, each person wanders around with a microcontroller, which is actually a Raspberry Pi and an, an Android phone. It's a kind of combination of a Raspberry Pi and an Android phone. Um, and this pair of Bose glasses. And then by wandering through a beacon field, the beacons communicate by OSC through the router back to a central computer, which has a cloud component that runs a state machine. The state machine tracks where everyone in the space is and then gives them scenes based on who they are and where they are and what time of the show it is. So we don't know where you're going to go, but wherever you choose to go, you will get a story that's relevant to your character, the time of the show, and where you are. And you see nothing, because all you have is a lantern. And all you get is audio that kind of spontaneously pops up out of your glasses. And so when the show runs, we should be able to move 24 people through it for two hours without ever interrupting them to give them a single instruction. Uh, so that's, that's where we're selling tickets. I'm not really good at the salesy part, but like you can, you can, <laughs> you can get tickets if you're interested. Uh, uh, every two hours about, hour and a half. That's, that's the idea, right? <laughs> and, like, that's, that, and to me, that's still kind of small. Um, 24 people is like a good, this is almost like a proof of concept in a lot of ways for the kind of technology that we're working on. We want to keep building this out because we're interested in building this potential. Like, and, and this is, like I said, very specifically proof of concept. We're exploring what the potential is. How am I doing? Okay. Uh, we're exploring what the potential is, you know, to, to actually see how much more control we can get over what the user's doing by more fine tracking, more kinds of interactions, more kinds of specific interactions. Right now, largely, uh, like a beacon is used for location tracking effectively. Like it has a radius and we know when you're in the radius. That's only one kind of input technology we could use. We could use any of those. Um, like anything that tracked you. We could use cameras. We could use RFID readings of scanning objects. We could use uh, uh, like direct buttons. Like any of those kinds of components could potentially be used to tell stories and then do interesting things. Now, I'm, um, like I'm, I'm telling you about my work because that's the work I know, right? And because that's the technology that I know. This is like what I've been working on. And I see all of this effectively as an extension of the work that I did um, in, you know, when I was getting my MFA. You know, this idea that you could kind of create state as a way of, of altering storytelling for people in space. I don't think that's the only use of this kind of technology, and I don't think that's the only way technology could interface with immersive theater in an interesting way. But what I want to suggest is that just like, I'm going to go back a bit, just like we can think about IoT like this, right? This technology and this video I showed is the same, right? The technology you see here and the technology I showed you here to score a card is identical use of technology. Like I, I, anything I did with this code was the most simple application I could do because I am a terrible programmer, right? And I'm not that like fluent, honestly, in how to use this kind of technology. But a simple use of technology like that can become a scoring system in a game. Like a simple use of a mobile technology to blast messages to people and receive text messages, something like Twilio, can be used to run a scoring system in a citywide competitive experience. Like a simple kind of technology that's used 
primarily to deliver information to speakers, because that's what OSC, OSC stands for, Open Sound Control. Its purpose is to send data to media servers to play speakers. Can be used to broadcast information between IoT devices of any sort in a large space. And so what I, the reason why I want to talk about this and the reason why I'm, I was interested in giving this talk in the first place is because I want to encourage people thinking about live experiences to like look at these technologies. They're really kind of simple to use. They are basically invisible. A beacon is this big. Like I'm not, this isn't a joke. I mean, it's actually this big. With a battery, it's about that thick. Right? That's it. Uh, kind of like a small room. Uh, you tune them though, and you can also, uh, a beacon also has a strength, an RSSI strength, and, and it's trackable through the Bluetooth uh, protocol. So you can also, you can either set the range of the beacon to limit it, or you can just set the devices to look for thresholds on the, on the beacons. And so you could just layer the space with beacons and just take the most powerful signal. Uh, they're usually battery powered. Like, like, you can get crappy beacons that have internal batteries that you can't replace, which I wouldn't suggest because they'll burn out in a couple years. Um, they run on, like, fairly large um, circular batteries. Um, or you can get ones that recharge, which I think are really good. Um, you can also just turn any microcontroller into a beacon if it has a Bluetooth signal, and then you just plug it into a wall. But those tend to be bigger. Like, the dedicated ones tend to be small. And they're, they're, you can buy one for $20, honestly. That, that will, do, will do you fine. Um, and, and, like, and this is not new technology, right? Like that kind of stuff you see everywhere. Like uh, my favorite example of this, and you should really check it out if you have the opportunity, is the Music Instrument Museum in Phoenix. Um, it's, a, it's a multicultural mu museum hidden as a music instrument museum. It's all about like different cultures around the world and how music is the universal language. But the experience is fascinating. When you go into the museum, they hand you this thing that looks like an audio tour guide. It's a headset with a little box. So you assume it's an audio tour, but it doesn't do anything when you walk in. Uh, when you go up to the second floor where the main exhibit is, it's a bunch of like standing exhibits with instruments. As you approach a booth, the sound of the instrument begins to play in your headset. And as you approach a different booth, that sound will fade down and another sound will fade up. What you are experiencing is beacon technology. The device has a bunch of audio files on it. It's detecting the beacon that's closest to it and it plays the thing for that beacon. And so that allows you to have a museum filled with instruments where you can hear all the music of those instruments, but only the instrument you're listening to without polluting anyone else's experience. The genius of that, by the way, is the way the audio fades in and out. It's really elegant and smooth, and that's why I would suggest you actually go see it, because it's, like, it's actually kind of wonderful to experience. But super simple technology, like nothing difficult about that technology at all. You could get a Bluetooth defect, uh, detector running on something like a Raspberry Pi in about five minutes. You just write the code and say, look for Bluetooth signals, and you will see all this stuff come up. So this is not difficult stuff. Yes? The Music Instrument Museum in Phoenix, Arizona. Other things have done this too. Like they, 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 they did a version of this at the David Bowie exhibit in Tribeca. Uh, more museums are starting to pick up on this, but it's like going to be a standard application of technology where like somebody comes up with something new and then everybody just literally copies it for a while. Not realizing that like the basic relationship of like I have a beacon and I can show you something based on a beacon or play you something based on a beacon is the same if it's not just like hearing music when you walk up to an exhibit. Uh, I, 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 I'm not, I, I hope you understand if you're, not a, if you're not someone who considers yourself technical, I learned how to code in grad school in like a year. So I am not a proficient CS person at all. So when I'm telling you it's easy, I mean it's easy for someone who sort of stumbled into it and figured it out. I'm really not kidding. And if you have technical people on your team, it is not hard to start incubating and prototyping these kinds of systems. So what I want to encourage you to think about is, is like what state can do, uh, hmm, whoa. Sorry, I lost, I lost my slides here for a second. Where are you? There we go. Uh, so what I want to encourage you to do is just think about how state can help audience. State uh, can make decisions trackable and meaningful, right? It means that decisions that you've done can be stored uh, in the system and then can impact the experience. So I know your exploration is meaningful because it's tied to the experience directly. 
um, it can be repeatable because I can, it can be dynamic, right? Like if you go a different way, something different can happen. And so you could actually have a very different experience based on totally random kinds of occurrences. It can be scalable because I, 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 the system itself can be a docent. Right? I don't need a human being to do that. I don't necessarily need a human being backstage all the time. I can offload things that would go to what I would consider meaningless and, and wasteful use of actors and allow actors to concentrate on what they're good at, which is performing, and what they actually want to do. I don't think many actors go, want to go into acting so they can lead people by the hand into a room. I'd rather let actors act. And it's accessible because it's seamless. Right? Because the technology doesn't have to be noticed. It doesn't have to be intimidating. We continue to make technology art in which we showcase technology. We flash LEDs. We use AI to make procedural fluid dynamics. We project on walls. I have no problem with that art. Some of it's gorgeous and amazing. But there's a whole other side of technology that is art. It's, te it's not the technology that's the, the, the symbol on your computer. It's the technology of your shoes, or your glasses, or your pen. It's the technology that you don't even call technology because you don't notice it, because you don't think about it, because all it does is facilitate the experience that you want. And I think that IoT gives us the ability to start creating aesthetic experiences that allow us to do that. And they allow us to do it not just in ways that make the technology unnoticeable, where the technology can disappear into the everyday object of the world, it means that I can now track, I can now change, I can now tailor experiences to the things that you've done in a way that's not only easy to do and not only powerful meaningfully, but in a way that makes it possible for me to do that with more people at lower cost. And I think that is the space I hope that immersive theater and live experiences can move into. Thank you. All right, so I ended a bit early, so I could talk for a while. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Michael Robbins. I, I lead an initiative here in DC that comes out of the Darkwood Foundation uh, called District of Learning. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. for learners. Um, we are doing asset mapping with teams um, and, um, and doing that for the uh, beta app that we've developed just to map all the learning assets in DC. Um, I'm interested in storytelling. I'm interested in credentialing. I'm interested in beacons. So I start to sort of think about like what would it be like if we use the kind of technology you were talking about and combine like Yeah, I mean, I think, I think those kinds of pieces come together in an interesting way, right? And I think that what I want to suggest is, like, 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 if you're thinking about this and you're not, I mean, this isn't you, but, like, I'm kind of for, the, for everybody else. Like, if you're thinking about this and you don't come from technology specifically, like, that's just not what you do. Like, the easy way to think about it is, sort of like, what are these things good for? Like, what do they allow to be possible, right? So games are good because games have challenge. And challenge is good because challenge motivates people, right? And so what you have is a motivator with a game. A game becomes a really good motivator. It has like a set of um, incentives and feedback that like drive people to interact. And so that's really powerful because it gets people moving, right? Um, state is interesting essentially 
um, in IoT because it allows me to take this thing that works super well in digital spaces and is super obvious in digital spaces and tie it to things in the real world. So I, I effectively, I like thinking of all of this as augmented reality because it, it is literally augmented reality. You know, and I, when I try to explain this to people who don't go do anything with tech at all, I usually tell them that like, VR is when I occlude all of your senses and I paint something new on top of them, right? I make you blind and deaf and then I paint something onto your world. AR is where I let you see the world and then I graffiti something on it, right? And I think we overthink about AR visually. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with visual AR, but like I can do that audially, but I can also do that in a non-sensory way. I can just track things. I can count things. I can record things. And like once I have that, I can use that. So I can know if you're the fifth person who came here, or the 10th person who came here, or the first person on the red team who came here, or the first person who came here after going to the, the first beacon. Right? And all of that stuff can then affect play, can affect movement, can affect decision making, can affect outcome, can affect story. And that is an affordance that's really good. Um, like ideas of like, like using things like beacons or RFID, like every decision I ever made with that, like beacons and RFID, was entirely about use case. It just had to do with what the technology can do and why it was good. RFID is completely, absolutely reliable. Like if you put an RFID chip on something, it reads it a thousand times without fail. But move it three centimeters the wrong way and you get nothing. Right? So like it's really good when I know you are going to put the chip on the sensor. Right? That's, that's great if I slide a card into a slot. There's no way to slide a card into a slot that's wrong. It's really bad if I tell you, put the, the book on the table. Because if you're off by an inch, I don't know the book's there. Right? Beacons are fields. They're great if I just want you to be somewhere around here. They're not so good for me knowing exactly where you are around there. And they have to find you which doesn't happen instantaneously. It can sometimes take time to find you. Not a lot of time, but for very, very fast things, too much time. And so that's the kind of decision making you're making about them. But then all of those affordances become real. And then what does it do? It, it like, I know I'm using this word magic, which I think that like, I'm using on purpose because I think that's the way people perceive it. Not because I think it's magic, because I know it's just stuff people built. But to people, that's magic. It is magic to walk up to something and have it know your name. It is magic to, like, to like, have gone to five places and then have a website populate the five places you went to without you doing anything. Right? That's how it feels to people. And that's a wonderful feeling that, that the world is responsive. And I think that like, the more we can lean into that, the more powerful that will be. But it doesn't have to be flashy or showy. It doesn't have to do anything other than just track. That, like, that alone is the power of the system. And so, yeah, I think these are great things to explore. I'm just, I'm just riffing too, right? But it's like, it's great, great things to erupt. Yeah. All right, I think you had something next? Yeah. That impressed me. Uh, the World War II Museum is doing stuff with RFID that's like, they're trying stuff. Yeah, New Orleans. I, I don't love it. I mean, it's, it's it, like, I don't love it because I think that the interaction is a little too hard, but I like what it produces. I like the way it intersects the space. I think that's really interesting. Um, what else have I seen that I like that's technology enabled? Um, I can't talk a ton about it, but I think the Cooper Hewitt is, is going to do some new stuff that's going to be really cool. Like they're doing some exploration. This is, I, should, I should confess my bias here that Rachel Eve Ginsburg is working with the Cooper Hewitt. So like one of my collaborators is working there. And so I, I just trust her and I think she's going to do really fa fascinating stuff. But I know they're interested in exploring that kind of stuff. There is an AI museum that's floating around. I don't know where it is, but it has some individual exhibition spaces around. And it's like exploring like what AI guided movement would be through a museum space. But a lot of this stuff is not being led specifically by museums. Oh, and AMNH, the, the, the um, American Museum of Natural History, actually has some really, in New York, has a lot of really interesting stuff. There was a guy who was there for a long time, Barry Joseph, who's a, one of the smartest people about technology I know, like intersection of technology and education. He's now at the Girl Scouts. 
Um, he in innovated a lot of really interesting things in that museum around like AR projects that, that explored the museum space or using like virtual teachers in the space through like robotics, like really fascinating stuff. Look up Barry Joseph, he's a genius, like he's, he's worth checking out. Um, I think museums are gonna get more and more into this space, but I think they're gonna be largely driven there by the museums, right? You know, the museum of ice cream or the museum of illusions um, because those things make a ton of money um, Color Factory makes a ton of money. Like they're very powerful uh, commercial experiences that are very thin and very disappointing um, for people who exit them. So I think there's like a handshake that's going to happen here where museums are noticing those spaces and they're going to start bending more towards those design principles. But a rigor in design coming into those spaces will hopefully amplify their performative experience. And that will lead to a middle space where you can actually capture an audience with the interesting design things they're doing without like really just like making a transparently thin experience. And museums, I think, have a unique opportunity to do that if they're willing to commit to those experiences. On the other hand, I think the, I did some work with the, the Holocaust Museum in DC, and that museum is amazing. And it can do this interactively without technology. Right? That museum does not require technology to do what it's doing, and it still, it, does, it still does an incredible job of doing it. So I think that a lot of the interactive principles I'm talking about can still be applied even if you don't want to invest a lot of money in technology. It's just sort of thinking about the user flow. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and like more of this is going to start popping up. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And like, and like you're going to see, I think there's really interesting things that are going to happen with this, especially on the educational side, because education is pretty smart about games now. Um, and they're, they're really interested in figuring out what they can do with them. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, what are you going to say? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, they satisfy all the, that is a use case example in nature of uh, being able to participate in a reality, scalable, you know, uh, approachable, meaningful, it, yep. It meaningful because it's all, and repeatable because it's always different and, and generated and, and kind of like practicing itself repeating. Um, so yeah, like dreams would be the good kind of paradigm for the user interface on that. Um, the second point is uh, I really like your use of the uh, internet of, internet of Oh, I mean, and, and this is like coming, right? Like, if you if you follow things like No Proscenium, which is like like the guides of of immersive work in different cities, audio tours are popping up everywhere. People doing these audio tours that aren't tied to anything that you can just kind of like hook into. So there are definitely people interested in this. But one of the first pieces that the Bose AR glasses showed, one of the first sponsored pieces, was a piece called Pilgrim, which was about uh, it's about a, 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 a like one of these. Um, uh, one of these pilgrimage trails, these old Christian pilgrimage trails in Spain, I think it was, and like you walked the trail by walking down streets. That has, a, by the way, a very old history. Um, like, like game experiences have been doing that for a long time. We showed a game and come out and play years and years and years ago, like in the first come out and play that was like, um, it was a meditation on the Iraq war and it was like p painting Baghdad over Washington Square Park and you could like go to different places and call and you would be looking at something that was sort of like something in Baghdad and they would tell you what you were looking at in Baghdad. So the idea of like reimagining space I think is quite powerful. It has this design issues about how that works because like getting people together for a show is actually like a good thing <laughs> in terms of entertainment. It actually... So, yeah, it serves a purpose. Uh, but, like, I do think there's a lot of potential for that, and I, I totally agree. I like the idea of dreams. People should just make pieces out of that 
That's not mine, but like, yeah, yeah. You just you just get rid of it. Now I, I now look. IoT is going to trans. I mean, there's just an Economist article, like literally just an Economist article this week about like chips with everything was their there was their joke title, and the idea that you know there are going to be chips in everything, and there are, right? Like, I mean, I could I could have done that part of this talk too. There's like 20 billion chips in the world. There'll be sensors on everything. Blah 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 blah. Right? Like, we could talk about like Moore's, where we're at with Moore's law and how small these things are going to get. I could tell you a Raspberry Pi. You can get a Raspberry Pi that's like that big that costs like 20 dollars. It's basically a computer. Like, it's it's like, and you can get like an Edison, which is literally this big and is a computer. Like actually a computer that's this big, so like, and it costs fifty dollars. So like, all of this stuff is 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 happening very fast. I don't really want to talk about that though, because what's going to happen is we're just going to find, like, I think we're going to keep finding fairly lazy uses for it, right? I think we're going to keep defaulting to like it's a hotel key card, except slightly better. I think the role of art in technology is to create new technologies by creating new use cases. And so I want to encourage people to do this in immersive spaces, not just because I like crazy immersive things, um, because I'm a LARPer and like, I like seeing the world go crazy with magic, but because I think that by doing that, we start defining use cases for this, because some of this technology is not new. right? Some of this technology is quite old. And like it's still not being used in very different ways. And I think it's just because artists haven't gone crazy on them yet. So what I want is for people in, like if we're talking about things that exist in the world, let's use the art form that exists in the world, which is performance, right? And let's let performers start making things with that technology because when performers start making things with that technology, they'll imagine things that don't actually make sense to current use cases, which are the future use cases. Right? The definition of a future use case is a use case that does not make sense in the present. So I think the more we start exploring that, the more interesting things we'll find and the more that will bear fruits, not just in creating really cool art that's meaningful to us and does all the cool things art does, but actually like informs what technology could be in the future. The other really nice, um, just, just to sell you on this really hard, it's not what I'm talking about, but I can't help it. The other really nice Economist article I saw was the, like a couple, about a month ago was the uh, other half of the internet. And it was basically an argument about how high-speed internet has basically reached half the population. And it was, and it was it, it, so it's sort of an analysis of like how is the internet going to, like high-speed internet through phones going to reach the other half of the population. And it was basically an argument that everyone is going to say it's going to be with productivity and getting work. And it's completely wrong because all of it is going to be games and video. Because that's what people use phones for and that's what they use phones for first. is like watching YouTube and playing games. So let them watch YouTube and play games because they'll get the productivity when they do that. Right? But we have the kinds of technology we have on phones, I believe, because we watch videos on phones. Because the demands of video are so high that it keeps pushing us to make phones faster and faster and faster. If we didn't have videos doing it, we wouldn't do it. 